You're listening to World of Empowerment Radio, your station for practical spirituality in a changing world. And here are your hosts, Angel Rose and Ahanu. I just got a gift tonight, and it says, warning, I may be prone to shenanigans and malarkey. <laughs> and that is very true tonight, so watch out for it. <laughs> yeah. I do, I do. We made them up. <laughs> My name is Ahanu, and you're very, very welcome. I have to say that over the last few days when we were putting this presentation together, I admit to being very homesick, I have to say. And when you get to see what we're gonna show you tonight, you will realize that I can't, bring, I, I can't bring you to Ireland tonight, but I can certainly bring Ireland to you, and that's what I intend to do. Now, I'm going to make a little apology in advance, and that is that Ireland has got thousands of years of history and culture. And it's impossible that I could cover it in the short space of time that we have here tonight. So I'm going to do it as much justice as I possibly can, but I need you to understand that there'll be things, there'll be wide swaths of history that we're going to be leaving out. There's going to be wide swaths of culture that we'll be leaving out, and there'll be millions of stories that I'll have to leave out. But we'll try and pick the little nuggets so that you get a feel for what it's like to be Irish on St. Patrick's Day. The other thing I want to say to you is that as we go through tonight, you will be forgiving, forgiven for believing that I work for the Irish Tourist Board. I can assure you I don't, but I'm very enthusiastic about what I'm showing you tonight, and the reason is because it's that, it's that magic, it's that magic that's in Ireland that I want to pull out of the ethers and pull from Ireland and bring it to you tonight. So if I was getting paid from the Irish tour, Tourist Boards, I hope that I could do it justice and that I'd be well paid for it. So what we're going to cover tonight, we're going to cover a lot of things. And the first thing, I'm going to give you a look, a quick look at modern Ireland the Ireland of today. And I'm doing it just so that you'll get a, a contrast between that and when we shoot back a few thousand years, in fact, over 5,000 years. The next thing we're gonna look at is a little place called Ishnuk, Ishnuk. It's an Irish word, Ishnuk, and it means the navel of Ireland. We're gonna talk about the Catstone, both of those in Westmead. These places may not be familiar to you just now, but as we go through it, you'll become more familiar with them. Newgrange, many people have heard of it. 2,000 years older than the Great Pyramid of Egypt. We're going to go to Nauth, Douth, and the Hill of Tara. I'm sure everybody has heard of Tara from Gone with the Wind. We're going to visit Down Patrick, where the three saints, St. Patrick, St. Bridget, and St. Colum Kill are buried. And in fact, at the end of the evening, we actually have a little water that we're going to offer you to sample from that burial site of St. Bridget. We're going to look at Skellig Michael. Skellig Michael. Skellig means rock in Irish. It's on the St. Michael line. You'll find out more about that in a few minutes too. And we're going to take a, a walk through Carrochiel Cairns, the largest collection of megalithic tombs in Europe, we're going to look at Ben Bulbin. It'll all come clear to you in a little while. Knock Naray and Queen Maeve in Sligo. We're going to then go on to Loch Gur, the largest stone circle in Ireland, in County Limerick. Uh, you may be familiar with Limerick. It's where Shannon is, so anybody who flies to Ireland would usually fly into Shannon, although now they've opened up Dublin for US traffic. We're going to visit Glen the Lock in County Wicklow, the Glen of the Two Lakes. It's called the Garden of Ireland. And then we're going to visit a place called Owen which is the Cave of the Cats. 
some very, very interesting stories about that place. And I'm going to say to you now in advance, there are some places that we visit that we're going to show you here where we allow ourselves to be very vulnerable. So I, I want you to come with us on the journey and allow for us because we, we do expose ourselves somewhat. And then the, we're going to finish with St. Bridget's Fire Temple and the Holy Well in County Kildare. Okay. Modern Ireland. This video, St. Patrick's Day 2014, Ireland Inspires, was developed by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Ireland and Falcha Ireland to celebrate Ireland's National Day. Almost 5 million people live here, but 70 million call it home. This top 10 country to grow up in, the birthplace of 24 Olympic medalists, 14 Oscar winners, 9 Nobel laureates, and for one moment, the best goalkeeper in the world. And those that left? Fill the world with O'Briens, Murphys and Kennedys. The heritage surrounding us lives in us. Newgrange is older than the pyramids and Stonehenge. Ireland is the first Eurozone country to successfully exit an economic assistance program, named as the best country in the world to do business by Forbes, while drawing acclaim for our creative work. Ideas aren't the only thing grown here. We're becoming one of the most sustainable producers of food and drink anywhere. Top 20 globally for quality of our scientific research. Number one globally for adaptability of our workforce, the youngest workforce in the EU. While 1,600 jobs were lost a week during the crisis, 1,200 jobs a week are now being created. Despite recent challenges, we're still Europe's most charitable people. Our waves are known to surfers around the world. 1,033 overseas companies choose us as their European headquarters. Eight of the top 10 global information and communication companies base themselves here. We've added the 10 largest online companies as friends, like Google, LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. And Irish innovation enhances lives around the world. In Haiti, thousands have clean drinking water thanks to Irish water filters. Irish technical and software powers the House of Parliament in London. And Irish technology powers the Paris Metro. And we do damn good rugby. Last year we welcomed 8 million visitors. Driven by the hugely successful Gathering Ireland event. This year the Wild Atlantic Way launches. It's the longest coastal driving route in the world. The Giro Italia takes in Belfast Armagh and 20,000 kilos of American footballer will rock Croke Park in Dublin. Our culture and music has reached the world. So this St. Patrick's Day, be proud. We're on our way. Creative Ireland, positive Ireland, love Ireland. Ireland inspires. This is the shape of Ireland. And you'll notice on the image there's a line of high crosses coming down across the center. And it's no accident that they were placed there. This is, these, these are the sites of the Celtic crosses, you know, the largest of the Celtic crosses in Ireland. And they tend to run along the ley lines. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but they're kind of earth grid lines. So Christianity knew what they were doing when they placed these monuments on these particular locations. But they also always placed them on top of pre-Christian, Celtic, pagan, Druid monuments also. So they knew how to crush something when they put their mind to it. Now, when you look at the size of Ireland, I want to put this in context for you. Ireland would fit three times into the state of Oregon. Okay, so 
it would take you an hour and a half to drive east to west and probably about three and a half hours north to south. So it's not a big place. But what's really interesting about it is there's 32 counties in here. And in each of the, those 32 counties have their own accent, their own musical tastes, almost their own culture. But for us, it can be difficult enough to actually understand the accent from the people in Cork or the people in Belfast, for example, in such a small area. I'm telling you that so as to give you an idea of the richness of the culture in such a small area. Now, we're going to be coming back to this map again in a few minutes, but I want to give you an idea. This is Shannon right here on the Shannon River. Okay, this is Dublin. This is Galway. This is Belfast. And this is Cork. And Cork is the location of where the Titanic last sailed from. She stopped in Cove County, Cork on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic. And that's where she picked up her, her passengers. Now, the first of our little stops is going to be in a place called Westmead. Westmead houses this little place called Ishnock. It's the royal residence. It's, it's the location of the fire festivals of Bealtaine. Now, I say that with the Irish pronunciation. You might know it as Beltane. Beltane comes from Baal, the, the, the fire god, and Tain or Tinna is the Irish word for fire. So it's the, the god of fire. And we're going to visit the hill of Tara. So this is the first signpost you come across when you come to Ishnak. It's the site of the royal residence. And here we look at this map again. I'm showing you this because you have to imagine that there's a line running north to south down the center and east to west across the center. And where they meet in the exact geographical center of Ireland is a hill called the Hill of Ishnak. Ishnak comes from the Irish word for navel meaning that place of nurturing or that womb center of Ireland. This is a map of the divisions of Ireland. You'll all be familiar with Ulster, anybody who has been listening to the news over the last 30 years especially, but it's been going on for over a thousand years, the difficulties that people have had in the north of Ireland. This is the flag of Ulster. Red Hand of Ulster. This is Leinster, this is Munster, and this is Connacht, the four provinces. But you'll notice in the center is the royal seat. So this is the ancient flag of Ireland, divided into four. Now what happened later, in later times, there became a fifth province. And that fifth province was where Tara is today. So all the high kings of Ireland were originally crowned in Ishnak, but in later years, after Christianity came and St. Patrick came, it moved to the hill of Tara. Now, this is Ishnak, and this particular stone here is steeped in history. Buried underneath this stone is the ancient goddess of Ireland called Iru. You might have heard the Irish name for Ireland is called Era, and this is where Era is buried. And where she came from, believe it or not, I'm going to stretch your imaginations now, but there's evidence to show that Eru was the daughter of a pharaoh's wife, a pharaoh's daughter, who sailed out the Mediterranean from Egypt and up the coast of Spain and France and arrived in Ireland and married a chieftain of Ireland. And she became synonymous with what Ireland was in those ancient times. It's the Irish word for Ireland, era. She's buried right there. Now, the cat stone also marks the exact spot of the four divisions, the four provinces of Ireland. Also, we, you will hear me speaking a lot about St. Patrick, and Angel Rose has her own things to say about St. Patrick also. 
St. Patrick came to Ireland in 432, and he changed Ireland forever. One of the things he did was formed a council of bishops that came to the Catstone in 1111. Now, 1111 is significant to us because Angel Rose was born on 1111. I was born on 211. So these 1111s keep coming up for us all the time. In 1111, St. Patrick uh, influenced, early on, he influenced the bishops to get rid of the ancient ways in Ireland, to get rid of the, the culture, to get rid of the belief systems, to shift paganism out, to crush it. And so they formed a council there at that location, and they were also responsible for creating the 32 counties of Ireland that we're familiar with today. Those 32 counties, you know some of them, Cork, County Galway, some of the more famous ones, County Galway, County, County um, Dublin, County Limerick. So this is Angel Rose's cue. She has a story to tell about this. Trees towards the back here. Um, and that's called the Ancient Royal Road. So here's the story. Ahano takes me to Ireland for the very first time. Let's put some to this. Okay. Um, and we're staying with his sister, and like a month goes by, and we're thinking, well, nothing's happening here. Next thing, this young man named Shane calls us and asks us to come to his home and do some readings for his friends. So we get in the car and it turns out that it's in this area and I said to Ahano, uh, what's in the middle of Ireland? And he says, nothing but bog. And I, bog, bog, bog which is turf. So I thought, okay, so anyway, we get there and it turns out that Shane's house is at the base of this royal road. And our bedroom was right at the head of the beginning of this road. Now this ancient road is where the kings marched up to the top of Ishnak Hill and were crowned. So all of a sudden we said, what are we really doing here? Okay, because we all of a sudden we knew this was much bigger. Not only that, when he showed us the map of his house and Ishnak Hill, it made an image of a skeleton key. Okay, so it turned out we knew it was a real significant place. So anyway, Ahano couldn't wait to get up that hill once he realized where we were. But I didn't go. It was raining. I had readings to do. So he and Shane, who, who went up together, and these fellows had just met. Shane was a young, handsome man. Uh, the two of them didn't know each other, but they go up this road, and they go to... And it wasn't the top of the hill, was no, it? No, the first, the first the ring. First the first tier, because mm. these hills all have rings around them and they just without speaking they started walking in opposite directions one went clockwise the other went counterclockwise they pass in the middle and when they passed in the middle Ahano just handed Shane this crystal that we had gotten from a large rock at a different part of Ireland it was like on cue these guys just started walking this pattern so next thing you know they prepared this area but they didn't go to the top so they come back about an hour and a half later, and Ahana's beside himself, because not only was he wondering, who is this guy, how do I know him, but he said, we were waiting for the women to come up. Okay, so um, there was Shane's girlfriend, Tilly, right? And this woman I read, Catherine, who I just met, and myself. And we just knew we were the three women. So. We start walking up this ancient road, arm in arm, and I say to her, I feel like I'm in a bridal procession. So we get to the top. Now, keep in mind, the men were behind us, and when we women got to the top of the hill, the men stopped. They didn't, as if they were guarding the place. It was the craziest thing, okay? So we get up there, and I just so happened to have on me the names of all the planets in an ancient language. And I just started toning the names of these planets inadvertently. And when I did, this shaft of sunlight came horizontal through the top of the hill and struck a spot on the hill where there used to be an ancient stone. 
we'll talk about that stone in the middle, but it had been taken, the rumor was by Merlin, it was taken to England, okay? So a lot of other things happened then, but we all had this kind of a cosmic experience. And when I found myself turning to the men and saying, will the two kings please come and take their rightful place? And Ahano and Shane, who we now knew were kings in a past life, came to the top. And there was the completion of this ceremony. So this is a stone circle on top of Ishnak Hill. It's over to the left on top. And so the others kind of dispersed and went their way. And, Ahano, and I said to Ahano, I want to go check out this circle. So we both walked over. And right where these outer stones are here, we hit this wall of energy. I mean, it was, it was so powerful. It just hit us. And we both got very emotional because we knew that weddings were performed here. And we looked at each other, and we both just said yes at the same time because we knew that we had been meant to marry here in the past, but we never made it. So we walked in here, and it was like that was our wedding. Now, this place is not called the bridal chamber by other people. It's called the bridal chamber by us because we knew that's what happened up here. Okay. So that's all I have to say about Ishnak Hill. So it turned out it was a lot more than bog in the middle of Ireland. Yes. Now, this, this hill, Ishnak Hill, has a lot of other prehistoric megalithic uh, stone monuments and barrows and uh, surf stone circles and various other things, a lot of which is still unexcavated to this day. Nobody really knows except that there are some incredibly uh, rich historical events took place, and especially the crowning of the, the ancient high kings of Ireland. It is also the place where at the solstices, the high king would go to the top and light a fire. And then that fire was seen all over all the other provinces in Ireland. And once they saw that fire, they'd all light their fires. So you, if you think of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, if anybody has watched it, and those towers where they built the fires, that's what it was like back then. So we will be coming back to those fires in a few minutes. But first, we have to go on to what happened after we left the hill of Ishnak. For 400 years, those fires were not performed. Nothing happened on the hill of Ishnak during all that period of time. And we like to think that we activated something, either in ourselves or in the land, or something happened, because that very same year, they held the first fire festival at Ishnak Hill in over 400 years. So I want to show you this little clip as to how powerful this place is regarded.
It's the festival of Bealtaine or Beltane. Keeping um, in mind that this Ishtak Hill is owned by a farmer, so there's cows running around and all sorts of stuff through there. But it was private land, and he never allowed anything to go on in the public until that they started that in 2012. Yeah. And then, very shortly after that, the same people who participated in that first fire festival, you might have seen those horses in the little film clip, they decided that it was time to make this a national event. And they actually got on their horses and they rode all the way to Dublin, right to the Houses of Parliament. And they got the permission, or they persuaded the Prime Minister to actually allow this festival to become an official part of the modern day calendar in Ireland. So now it's an annual event. The Return of the King, just like in the Lord of the Rings. Return of the King. So now we're going to move over to the Hill of Tara. And I want you to take notice of this particular standing stone right here. The other one is actually a gravestone. But this stone on the right-hand side is very significant. This is an aerial view, and you can see the stone here on this side, and you can see that burial cross that's right there. But look at the, the, the circles. These are called barrows. And this hill, called the Hill of Tara, it puzzled me for years and years and years as to why any tourist would ever bother to go there. Because that's all there is, is a standing stone and a cross. But that same year, we got married there for the second time. Angel Rose, you may want to tell that little story real quick. Uh, our first marriage was in Connecticut, in the United States, and we got married with this pre-Atlantean wedding ceremony uh, that was quite beautiful. Actually, you got up at sunrise and you said vows at sunrise and when you did, your DNA started to entwine together. And then you'd come back again at sunset and you'd say your vows at the end of the, the day and that was the completion of your DNA's uh, blending together. Okay. Anyway, um, since that time, they kind of had an upgraded form of the ceremony, which involved putting uh, particular light codes into the land. So when we were in Ireland, we knew we had to get married in Ireland, you know, for the second time for the upgrading of the vows. And I asked Spirit, where should we get married? And it said the Hill of Tara. And I was a, a bit surprised because of all the places in Ireland, Tara didn't impress me. And it didn't impress me because there are so many ceremonies up there. There's druids, there's all sorts of new age metaphysicians who go up there and do all these ceremonies. And when I went there, I felt that the energy was pretty chaotic because of that. But anyway, we did what we were told and we went up there and we got married again up there and it rained the whole entire time we were saying our vows. In fact, we had a, a symbol code that had to do with the ceremony on the ground. And when we were saying our vows, it became three-dimensional. It became a three-dimensional sphere on the ground while it was raining. And then as soon as we were finished, the rain stopped, the sun came out. <laughs> okay. So it's we, like we washed it's... those codes into the land. Yes. So that was the second, yeah. the second wedding. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this place is you, you, you heard me mention earlier on about the four divisions in Ireland, the four provinces. So when Christianity took hold after St. Patrick introduced it, the seat of the high kings of Ireland moved from Ishnach to here. This is actually the barrow surrounding the king's royal palace. That's all that's left of it. But further down here is actually the royal entrance where all the courtiers and all the bards and all the other people belonging to the royal family, the royal court, all came in in this direction. Now, standing at the top of this hill 
If you turn 360 degrees, you can count 11 churches. And those 11 churches are all situated on other sacred mounds. And many people are of the opinion that those churches were purposely placed there by Christianity to stop the flow of the ancient energy along those ley lines because each of those churches have spires and they act like antennae. Can I just comment on that? So sure. what they're really doing is they, know, they knew the intersecting points of those ley lines contained uh, sacred geometry and a lot of potent energy. So by putting a church there and the spire is actually an antenna, so they, they put their altar right over the intersection of those grid lines. And that is the way that they would broadcast all your prayers, all their dogma gets magnified and gets sent out the grids. So it was their way of usurping uh, the earth religions and bringing in Christianity. So that's why we have a little bit of an angst against it, Ahano and I, in case you couldn't tell, um, because we knew what they were doing. And when we went to Glastonbury tour, by the way, in England, Glastonbury is a huge uh, power intersecting point. And when we went up there, we clearly got a vision actually from the elementals under the ground that when they built the church on top of Glastonbury, it was actually used for mind control. You know, they gathered the energy from Earth and they would broadcast through that area into the, um, into the, the grids around the Earth and they would broadcast certain messages to the people. So just to give you a heads up on what's really going on there. Okay, that stone, that standing stone I pointed out, is called the Leah Fall. Fall is the Irish word for destiny, and Leah is a gray stone. So it's the stone of destiny. Now, why is this important? The reason this is important is because everybody, I'm sure, has heard of Jacob's Ladder. Yeah? Well, let me read this. This is from Genesis 28, in the Old Testament. At sundown, Jacob arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. He found a stone for a pillow and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a ladder that reached from earth to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down on it. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather and your father. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I will give it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will cover the land from east to west and from north to south. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I will be with you and I will protect you wherever you go. I will someday bring you safely back to this land. I will be with you constantly until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. Then Jacob woke and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the gateway to heaven. The next morning he got up very early. He took the stone he had used as a pillow and set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it. Genesis 28, 10 to 18. Now, besides the royal family, the prophet Jeremiah is known to have come to Ireland. There's actual physical evidence in the stone carvings of Jeremiah arriving in Ireland. And it is said that he came to Ireland with that pharaonic princess who later married a high king of Ireland. Jeremiah brought with them some remarkable things, including a harp, an ark, now let me stop there for a second because I want to tell you that there are several people who believe that the Ark of the Covenant is actually buried on an island off the coast of Dublin called Ireland's Eye. The harp since became the symbol of Ireland and he brought with him a wonderful stone called the Leah Fall or the Stone of Destiny. Many kings in the history of Ireland, Scotland and England have been crowned sitting over this stone. 
including the present Queen of England. The stone rests today in Westminster Abbey in London, and the coronation chair is built over and around it. A sign beside it is labeled Jacob's Pillar Stone. Okay, now, when that stone came to Ireland, there were several wars going on between the English king and the Scottish kings and queens and the Irish kings. And a, a Scottish king by the name of Fergus came to Ireland to take this stone. He, he successfully managed to take the stone and brought it to Scotland. And subsequently, um, it was taken over by the English when the English uh, royal house merged with the Scottish royal family and united the, the United Kingdom. The stone went to Westminster Abbey. Now, interestingly enough, that same King Fergus of Scotland, the, the following time he visited Ireland, he actually sank off the northern coast of Ireland in a place that is now known as Carrick Fergus. Has anybody ever heard the name Carrick Fergus? Very famous song, Carrick Fergus. But that was because of the King of Scotland. Now, you can begin to see where this is going. This is, this is deep, deep stuff. This goes back thousands of years. Well, as you can see, it looks like a huge phallus. No big mystery there. However, I did have a dream one night about this, and what I was shown was it has an underneath part that is huge. Okay, and not only that, under the ground there are all these tunnel systems and waterways, and this is where we have stories of the she coming through, which is the Irish word for the fairy kingdom, but also kings and queens would travel those waterways underground in boats. And um, so there's this whole tunnel labyrinth system underneath the ground through probably just about every country we're finding out now that all connect together and they're all connected by aquifers or waterways. So more about that in a minute. Okay, there's one other thing on the top of the Hill of Tara and it's a statue of St. Patrick. Of course. Now, why is this important? I'm going to tell you how, Christi how St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland. He did it by deceit. And what he did was, and I'm sorry if I'm blowing anybody's preconceived ideas about what happened, how Christianity started here in Ireland. What happened was, he knew that the only way to get to the people was to usurp the power of the kings. He had to undermine the power of the kings. So you remember the fire festival we talked about. So every year, the beginning of springtime, the king would light the fire, and as Angel Rose pointed out, then the coastal fires would light, and within minutes, all of Ireland was alight. And then the people would take those, uh, an ember from those fires and bring them into their homes and light their own fires in their own heart. And this was the way culture grew, and this was the unifying factor in ancient Ireland. St. Patrick recognized this was what went on. So he went in the darkness, he went to a different hill called the Hill of Slain, and he lit a fire, which is now known as the Paschal Fire. He lit a fire on the Hill of Slain. In the darkness, the people didn't know which fire it was, and they assumed it was the king's fire, and suddenly all the coastal fires were lit, and the kings were standing there twiddling their thumbs with no fire. And with that, St. Patrick took over the power and control of the people in Ireland. Now, we could go off on various tangents talking about the Hill of Slain, but, but we won't. As I say, we're going to have to shoot way past some amazing stories. I'll just comment about it that in pagan times, it was a hill where the women went and lit a fire and um, did ceremony to the earth and for fertility. So it was a feminine place of ritual long time ago. Probably why you picked that hill. Huh? Yeah, because suddenly it became masculine. We're going to move now up to the north of Ireland. You remember I pointed out Belfast in the top right-hand corner of Ireland. That's where St. Patrick is buried. It's also the site of Down Cathedral, which stands on top of the Mound of Down. Now, I mentioned about 
Christianity putting these churches on top of these mounds. This is another example of a, of a sacred site where a Christian Catholic church is built on it. Yeah, I feel a huge apprehension, and we haven't even arrived in Downpatrick yet. We're probably about five miles from it, and I feel a kind of a wall of energy is in my solar plexus. I feel it in my chest, and I feel the apprehension. In fact, it's bordering on fear. Now, it's not logical, so I, I can't really put my finger on why I would feel this way. I'm just reporting what I feel. And I feel like as if I was a young warrior going into battle and knowing that I may not come home again. It's just that serious. I've, I feel worried, I feel concerned, I feel vulnerable. And I feel as if I'm facing up to a formidable foe is what I feel. It's, it's not like I'm going in here feeling invincible or feeling enormously courageous. I, I'm not. I'm feeling vulnerable and I'm feeling a little trepidation. And my throat is getting sore. I feel a restriction in my thyroid area. So I'm just reporting this because I don't know what to expect, but we will look to having the highest heroic outcome out of it. As we approach Downpatrick, the burial place of St. Patrick, St. Bridget and St. Column Kill, and which later became the church centre of control in Ireland. So you'll gather that that was a little recording that we made in the car on our way there. This is Holy Trinity Cathedral on the Mound of Down. Okay, so this is the church they built on this mound. And um, like Ahanu mentioned, three saints are buried on this mound, St. Patrick, St. Bridget, and St. Colum Keel. So our purpose for going there was to make mother tinctures from these grave sites as we were guided to do so. So we got there quite late. We only had 10 minutes to go in the church. So we brought the water in and we just allowed ourselves to be guided to where the energies of these saints were. And um, I went right up to the altar and I immediately had a vision of St. Bridget. Now, nobody really knows what she looks like, but she appeared as a, gr a girl, a young woman, let's say around 20, the most gentlest being you could ever imagine with a a burgundy velvet short cape on and a skirt. And uh, immediately she said to me, you could never be condemned. And it struck me in such a way where I was just overcome with understanding. And it was like she was saying, in fact, the whole image was actually, I, was, I saw a huge palace of royalty as if you were gonna go up in front of a king and be judged. And she had me come in this palace, and that's when she said that. Now, more happened later on our way home, but suffice it to say that I'm not big into saints at all. And I was shocked. Uh, we were shocked that we were even told to go make a tincture out of these places. But um, a lot more happened after that, but that is one of the waters we have tonight for you all I hope uh, to sample is the mother tincture of St. Bridget from this place. And I can tell you that it's an extremely powerful essence. So um, we actually chose three waters to bring tonight. We won't be able to try them all, but we have that. We have a tincture from St. Patrick, St. Patrick's grave. And we have a mother tincture from St. Bridget's fire temple. So we'll see how we get on. But um, that's the one which we picked for today being St. Patrick's Day and all about Ireland. Okay. This is an hour and a half presentation and we're now halfway through. We will take a short break right here. And in part two, we will cover Skellig Michael and the Beehive Huts, Carol Keel, Ben Bulban and Queen Maeve's tomb on Knocknaray. 
We'll go to the Grange in Loch Gur, which is the largest stone circle in Ireland. We'll visit Glendalough in Wicklow, which is known as the Garden of Ireland. And then we will go to the Cave of the Cats in County Roscommon. And we will finish with St. Bridget's Fire Temple and Holy Well in County Kildare. So thank you for being with us for this first part. We look forward to seeing you again very shortly for part two. You have been listening to Angel Rose and Ahanu on World of Empowerment Radio, your station for practical spirituality in a changing world.